Namaste. Welcome to another episode of Yoga Vasishta. Today I want to cover a question, a really excellent question. Uh, one of our viewers posted on a forum on Facebook dealing with Yoga Vasishta. Now, <laughs> we've been going through book one, and book one is very elementary, very preliminary. Uh, his question, though, is from nearly the end of the book, uh, the second part of book six on nirvana. So it's quite a bit more advanced than the material we've been going over. And <laughs> it also will give you, those of you who like to skip to the end of the book, <laughs> see how it ends. It will give you a preview of uh, the advanced topics toward the end of the book. And I think you'll find it, as I did, very interesting. Uh, this question opened up a rabbit hole, <laughs> a really deep one. And I've been going, exploring it since yesterday and made me very excited to understand some of the uh, how can I say, the most advanced concepts in Yoga Vasishta. So let's take a look at this question. Infinity Seeker wrote, I couldn't understand something. Does Brahman have desire or will? Vasishta said Brahman is all calm and tranquil. But later he also explains how this creation, although unreality, is the will of Brahman. For example, how can the production or destruction of anything take place in the emptiness of spacious consciousness? How can any condition or change be attributed to the formless intellect at all? The great Kalpa ages and all periods of time and parts of creation are mere attributes of consciousness. Consciousness is only an attribute of Brahman. They all merge into the great Brahman. Consciousness is a formless and purely transparent substance. Phenomena are subject to its will alone. One sees an object appear according to the will or wish that he has in his mind, like the fairylands of imagination. Whoa, now, wait a minute. <laughs> well, this ties in with what Rama has been saying in the beginning chapters of book one, that this world and the phenomena that we perceive in it are simply imaginary. So the later part of the book explains how this is so in great detail and with many, many examples. And this is just one of them. It comes at the end of a long discussion, a lecture actually by Vasishta, in regards to a question by Rama about what happens after the cosmic dissolution. Everything enters into Brahman and disappears. There are no more phenomena no more space and time, no more objects, no more consciousness, at least of the material world. It all simply vanishes and goes away. And then the question is, how does Brahman create again? Huh? When it's stated in many places that Brahman has no will, and performs no action. But this is one of the central points of Yoga Vasishta. And before I get more deeper into the answer, I want to back up and give a little context. The world appears differently depending on our point of view. Now, on the face of it, this is obvious, right? 
If we are standing at the foot of a mountain, the view of the mountain is going to be different than when we're standing on the top. Isn't it? Obvious, right? <laughs> but it doesn't seem to be obvious to most people anyway, that our view of the world when we are immersed in the body, the mind, the ego and the senses is going to be different from the view that we have when we are in Brahman. Now, what are these two views and how do they differ? Well, the external view of the world is based on differences, phenomena, activity, motion, location, space and time, and viewing different objects in the creation as entities having real existence. That's the way most people see things. And of course, in the phenomenal world, there are an unlimited number of viewpoints. And each of them are different. But the one thing they all have in common is that they are relative. Relative and temporal. In other words, what you see depends upon when you look. Because things are constantly changing in this world. On the other hand, we have the view from Brahman. And in Brahman, there is no space. There is no time. There is no causality. No objects. There is only the supreme subject, Brahman. So Brahman is aware of himself as unlimited existence, knowledge or consciousness and bliss, sat chit ananda or aum, aum. Huh? The a in aum stands for existence. The U stands for consciousness. And the N at the end stands for bliss. Ananda. So this is Brahman's view. In Brahman's view, there is no change. There is no time. No cause and effect. No differences. Everything is one. There are no boundaries. There is just unlimited, boundless, infinite existence, knowledge, and bliss. How boring, right? <laughs> Somebody commented on the, on the uh, video the other day. Well, when I'm in Brahman, everything seems boring. <laughs> There's nothing going on. <laughs> well... That's because <laughs> our minds are conditioned by phenomena. And in the phenomenal world, things are going on all the time. Things are changing. But in Brahman, there is no change. There's no need for change. If you have unlimited existence, knowledge, and bliss, well, what needs to change? <laughs> Anything that changes would be a step down from that. So, <laughs> if we look at that with our minds, it might seem boring or static. But to actually experience it during meditation is wonderful. In fact, that is nirvana. That is enlightenment. That is the highest ecstasy. So... We can experience this very easily simply by becoming desireless and egoless. And when we do, we see the divine light. Huh? We connect with that unlimited consciousness. 
that sees only itself. So self-awareness or consciousness of consciousness is the uh, quality of Brahman. And we all have that quality within us. It's accessible to everyone, every sentient being. But when we look at Brahman from the mind, from the phenomenal world, from intellect, we draw boundaries. First of all, we draw a boundary between I and Brahman. My self is different from his self. I am an individual. <laughs> and then we draw all kinds of other boundaries about here and there, then and now, huh? you and I and him, <laughs> and mine and yours and his and ours and theirs. <laughs> All these boundaries and abstractions, which we project upon Brahman. And then guess what? He shows us a face or a form according to our projection, according to our desire, according to our concept of reality. That's not his real face. It's not his real form. He doesn't have a form. <laughs> because all form means boundaries. All form means distinctions and differences. And those don't exist within Brahman. So then how is it <laughs> that Brahman allows himself to be differentiated? Well, the answer is he doesn't. It's all a dream. Huh? Just like when we go to sleep at night, and this whole world, this whole reality disappears. This body, this identity that we have in so-called waking life <laughs> disappears and we find ourselves in a whole new world with a different body, a different identity, different surroundings and people and so on, and all these crazy things happening that could never happen <laughs> ordinarily. Oh, where is that world? Huh? Where does it exist? But when we wake up in the morning, poof, it's gone. So, of course, the same is true of our ordinary waking consciousness, that when we go to sleep at night, it disappears. So all these experiences of differentiation, of distinction, of boundaries, of time and change, of form, activity, causality, huh? and all of these other relative phenomenal experiences are simply the projections of our own mind and intelligence on Brahman. And then he simply shows us out of his unlimited qualities, the ones that we want to see based on our projections, on our desires. So what is Brahman? How does he look? Or what are his nature and quality? It depends on where we look from. If we're looking from this material world, then we might want to say, oh, God is a person and he's the creator and he emanates all this matter and energy. Huh? He creates time and space and he does this and he does that and he does so many things. But if we enter Brahman itself, uh, putting aside our mind, our ego, our desires, our personality, and what we find is that within the Absolute, within Brahman himself, there is no change, there is no desire, there is no will, there is no activity at all. No boundaries, no qualities, no names or forms, no time, no space, <laughs> no nothing. <laughs> Only unlimited 
being, knowledge, and bliss. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam